Hey guys, Space Marine 658 here. Today we're going to be covering the actual implementation of our 2D widget, our 2D slider. So covering this, we're basically going to talk about how to actually create it, how to actually limit the size of the 2D slider so that way it doesn't take up the full square that we're going to start off with. But when talking about implementation, uh, the first thing you're going to want to think about is uh, actually like, you know, any tools you might have in your toolbox or that might make your life a little easier. Um, so we're going to start with Unreal Engine doesn't actually support um, things like 2D sliders out of the box, at least not easily. And so we're going to actually use a plugin that's included with Unreal Engine, uh, but is not on by default. So if you go to your plugins um, and type in synth, uh, at least last I checked, it wasn't on by default. I had to turn it on. Um, so there's something called synthesis and DSP effects. If you go ahead and check mark that, um, this should give you um, a pretty cool 2D slider we're about to work with. Uh, so first, let's go ahead and create a blueprint class. Now, depending on if you're using common UI or not, you'll have to make sure you use the correct base class. Uh, if you are using it, of course, you want to use something like an activatable widget or a user widget. Uh, depending on how you're actually using this widget. Uh, if you're not, if you're using just a regular one, you can just use a user widget, uh, but make sure to take that into account that you're not forgetting to use the correct base class. Uh, since I'm using common UI, I use a common user widget, but uh, everything we're doing today shouldn't need any common UI knowledge. Uh, so we'll call this a widget blueprint 2D generic slider. And if I misspelled generic, make sure to make fun of me, but I don't think I did. Um, and then what we're going to want to do is, you know, what's our base behind this going to be? This is going to live somewhere, uh, but we're still going to want to wrap it in something. Um, so I'm thinking maybe a, a common border. Um, you could use a border or you could use an overlay. Um, just depends on what you're doing. Border can only have one child and overlay can have multiple. Um, for this, it's all going to be wrapped in a vertical box probably anyway, so I'm not too worried about whether or not it can have children. Um, now, I could leave the style blank, but I actually have a blank border style. I prefer to use that just because it gives me the ability to affect padding and things like that to all of my blank styles all at once. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. And then I'm also going to then add a vertical box. And we'll also include a size box. Now, um, for the size box, um, you can do a... A uh, couple of things here. Now you can use the width and override and height override. That generally works well, but sometimes if the scale doesn't quite work out right, um, you may want to just have a min and max design with the height. That allows it to scale a little better. So if maybe at a small size you want it to be more square, but maybe at a big size it can be a little bit more rectangular, um, you can then make sure to put in the correct heights. Uh, for this one, it's kind of going to stay similarly uh, as aspect ratio the same. Um, so for now, we'll just do something like this and set this into the center. Uh, and let's actually set this to desired on screen. That way it looks a little more accurate to what we'll see in game. Now we're gonna wanna include our uh, 2D slider here that came with the synth plugin. And I've got my own image. If you don't, you'll want to go ahead and create one in your um, software of choices. We talked about the last one we created sort of a basic setup, but I, I went ahead and actually created a full fledged one. Um, at, as you wish, you know, create one yourself or you could either download one or something to that effect. So let's do, I'm going to make mine a little bit wider because I think my triangles just tear wider. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then let me set my handle image or thumb image here. Uh, a sync icon. I'll use something like that and set it to like 16 by 16. Uh, all right. So the big part of this, this synth slider, which we'll just rename to 2D slider. Um, by default, it's a um, square slash rectangular um, type of slider. So you can go upper left, upper right, bottom left, bottom right. But you know, sometimes you want to do uh, things that are a little bit differently, maybe a circle, maybe a triangle. I'm going to show you how to do it for a triangle, specifically the numbers. But technically, you could use any numbers here. If you know a little bit of math, you could use any kind of numbers here you want uh, to make it a little bit more flexible. 
Um, one thing you also want to look at is the step size. So that's, you know, when you move this handle, it's like how far does it go for jumping? With 0.01, that's basically just free drag and drop. Uh, but if you did like something crazy like 0.5, uh, that would mean that you're going like jumps of half. So you, you can only do like upper, middle, lower, left, right, uh, and then maybe here depending on the actual math and how it works out with the steps. For now, we'll leave it the same. Uh, leave it kind of default. Uh, this lets you indent if you want to leave a little bit of room around the actual handle itself. Uh, this is how you can lock it. So if you have a locked image and you want to lock a handle, that's how you do it as well. Uh, so I'm going to be right back. I'm going to go drag in the math. Um, and then we'll, don't worry, we'll walk through each piece step by step. But I want to get it all in and set up so that way it's very easy to flow and walk through. All right. Welcome back. Um, so basically what we're gonna wanna do here for our generic 2D slider is a couple of things. We're gonna create a function up here and then we're gonna actually handle the live updates. Um, so first let's take a look at this function. Uh, all this function is, is it's just a custom event. So if you right click and type in custom event, um, add a custom event, and then we're just adding an input of a vector 2D. Um, this is going to be basically how we can set this value anywhere. Um, so the cool thing is, for example, let's say on construct, if we want um, our value to be anything but the pure plane zero zero, um, when it constructs, one cool thing we can do is we can just call our set value. Um, and let's say we want it to be the true middle of that triangle. Well, true middle of this triangle is actually 0.5 by 0.65. Um, that is the actual equidistant from every one of the corners. Um, now, how does this actual set value clamped actually work? Um, so let's go ahead and open this up. In fact, actually, one thing we can see here to, to see that it's working is on this pre-construct. We can actually um, fire this pre-construct here. And what this will do is means that design time, which is what we're in right now, uh, we can actually see the handle go right to the dead center. So you can see here, this is right dead center. Um, so what this set value does is we take this in value and we pass it into this function, which is just a function I created over here. If we go in here, um, we're doing a couple things with it. First, we're going to clamp the value inside of another function, which is this is a, just a pure function. Um, you don't have to have it be pure, but I like to have pure functions because it makes everything a little cleaner. Uh, and this just returns that clamped value. And then from here, we're setting it to a variable called current value, which is just a vector 2D. And then we're passing that current value into that 2D slider that we added to our widget there. So let's go ahead and this just comes with that widget by default, comes with our 2D slider, send 2D slider. Uh, but let's actually take a look at how we're clamping the values to keep it within that triangle. So we go in here, what this is doing is we're first breaking that vector 2D into its component parts, the X and the Y. And then we're taking that and we're mapping it so that um, the Y is mapped to a min and max value to clamp the X. Now the actual Y itself, we just return. Uh, but what we do is we use this Y as a driver to clamp the X. So as you look here, we have a map range clamped. And this is taking that Y as a value. And then we're remapping this. So what a mapped range clamp does is it goes, okay, what should I expect to receive? And when I receive values somewhere in these ranges, what should I output? Now, as you can see here, we're taking the Y and we're saying you should get from a zero to one, which is top to bottom, and you should put out from a 0.5, which is the middle, to the bottom a 0 0.0. Now, what this is doing, if you're looking at a triangle, right, it's saying that if you're at zero on the Y, so you're all the way at the top, the minimum and maximum of your X is 0.5. As you can see here, it's 0.5. Now, what we're doing on the max is we're saying one minus this value. So as you get lower, you can have a um, x that, or sorry, you can have an x that is either to the left or to the right of that middle. By having that one minus on the max, it means more to the right. On the min, more to the left. But as you can see here, we're returning 0.5 to zero. So if you're dead center, so your Y is zero, you can only be at an X of 0.5. That is the most you could be at, both min and max. But let's say you go down towards zero or uh, towards one on the Y. So that means that you are, you're gonna have the full range of anywhere from 
zero to one. And so by doing that, you lock it into a triangle. Um, now, of course, if you want to do like a circle or a, a hexagon or something like that, you gotta do a lot more advanced math. But for a triangle, it's actually relatively straightforward. Uh, and then what happens is these get passed into this clamp here where we just take this X, clamp it, and then return that X. So what happens is that value gets clamped, it gets sent back here, and then that gets updated every single time um, that set value clamped gets updated every single time we want to actually update. Now, uh, what we've got here is we're pulling directly the value. Every time we update, we're pulling directly the value of where that bar is currently. Now, in theory, you could make a 2D vector here and just pass in these, but I find it doesn't necessarily get as accurate. Sometimes, for some reason, the, the one or the other value may not actually trigger an update. Um, if you are, you know, following these execution lines, um, at least from my personal experience. So I just pull it directly from that 2D slider. Um, now, the cool thing is, you know, let's say we want to do something with this now. So we've got all this in here. You know, we're setting the default. Uh, we want our players to be able to move that little bar, uh, but we don't want them to necessarily, you know, have a you know, 0 0.5 and a 0 0.2 may not be the values we want. Maybe we want one for each corner, right? So how do we actually do that? Well, let me go ahead and show you. It's a little bit more advanced. Let me show you in my actual full-fledged version here in my, uh, my own personal one. So what you're going to want to do is when you're going to set that value clamped, um, I do it in my set value text is uh, take that input and we're going to call a function called return value modifier. This is what I've created. Uh, it's another pure function. Uh, but by using those two inputs, we can actually return three different values. So what we're doing to do that is actually comparing the distance of where the current point is to each of the corners. So we go, OK, uh, from the top, the 0.5, we get the distance to it. We get the distance to the bottom left side and we get this to the bottom right side. And then from there, we just clamp that float um, between a zero to one and then we minus it from one. And that basically tells you how far away from one are you. So if you're in the bottom left and you're comparing it to the bottom left, you're going to get a value of one. For the other two spots, you're going to get a value of zero versus if you go to the top, you're going to get a value of one. But for the other two values, you're going to get a value of zero. So this lets you use this in such a way that you can actually, let me show you here. You can actually have different data points based on each of the corners. So you see here dead center, we've got the 0.375 for each versus if I go over here, boom, we got a one for product density, zero for reliability and zero for maneuverability. And then from there, you can take that when it's returned and just do a bit of math on it. Um, and so to get that value back, it depends on how you want the value. Personally, I like to keep things in their original form. Um, so I just set these in the text only. Uh, but for my actual um, data here, for the interface, interface that I use to pass that data back to my actual um, UI element that I want to use to update my gameplay, um, I pass it in as that vector 2D structure. The reason for that is I want to localize where changes happen to that blueprint. Um, I don't make any changes here to that blueprint here because this should be something that handles that. This is meant to be as generic as possible. So I don't want to actually handle blueprint math changes here. Now, when it comes to the setting value text, this is not a huge deal to do the math here because um, I'm kind of showing it to the player, um, but the actual gameplay understanding of what's happening, that shouldn't happen here in this widget. So instead, I'm passing it up the chain to our My Options menu, and in here, this is where I'm actually having that interface be called. So it passes the information up here. I take that value, and I go into my engine modifier, and here, for now at least, I'm just setting that modifier because this is a blueprint. This is just meant to hold that value so that when the player creates that engine, they get that, val that value passed to the missile. The missile then decides what it's going to do with those 
uh, actual values. But I store that build data here, uh, so that way that missile will have that information when it spawns in. Uh, but yeah, that should be pretty much it. That handles pretty much everything. Uh, you should have a triangular slider now and be able to handle that data. Uh, if you have any questions, definitely leave them down below. But otherwise, good luck and good hunting.